I'm sure that any remembrance of me will be measured in the merit of my words and my actions. You know, as so, and as they should be. You know, I mean, you can you can say and do things that people may not particularly like, but if you do them in earnest and and, and you know you believe them, you believe in them, then you know as long as they're you're, you're, they're not inhumane, I guess. Then uh, how could you have been wrong? Three different ones. There's white, black, and gray. So you can get three different records. You gotta go get all three. Exactly. So you just need uh, download it. That's the well, that's the point. That's why we did it. We can be pricks too. <laughs> I need to go to the washroom. No, that's the rest. You gonna follow me in there? You wanna <laughs> Are we that close yet? No. As a young person, when you were out buying records and going to see shows, you were certainly immersed in, in being a fan with a lot of bands. Now you're that person mm -hmm. that people are writing to. Mm -hmm. I suppose where I'm going with this, is is it weird for you? It's a little bizarre, sure. You know. Is it something that you can never get used to? Mm, I mean, I, I don't think you get used to it. You kind of enter into kind of a... I don't know, I'm reticent to say comfort level about it, but, you know, I guess you're, you, you become acclimatized to it somewhat, as best you possibly can. I mean, I've always been a reclusive person to begin with, so to me, you know, like, when you walk down the street, eyes move, that kind of thing, and, you know, or if someone runs across Berlin's traffic and tackles you to the ground. <laughs> My si yeah, that has happened, yes. Everyone asks you that question, what kind of band are you? Right. And you know, it's impossible to answer, though I did find the ultimate answer. Classic rock of the future. <laughs> well, there you there go. You go. <laughs> I'm wearing the same grin. I take it all on the chin. I still believe everything that I read. Sometimes it's hard. Sometimes it's harder. Sometimes it's on sale. Sometimes it never fails. Well, I have a side and she says I love you. She says my destiny is turning out all wrong. Now I just sit here and think of meaningful things to say. To new fans of this band, they, they may be surprised that the, the earliest exposure in terms of music for you was folk. Yeah. yeah. True. A good training ground? I was raised on it, really. My dad was a huge Simon and Garfunkel, Jim Crochet, Don McLean fan. That and Big Band. So, you know, when I first picked up a guitar... No, I, but actually, to be honest with you, it was just necessity. Because I was sitting in a basement with a guitar. And when you're by yourself and you play acoustic guitar, that's what people classify it as. I wouldn't consider Billy Bragg to be so much of a folk musician, but that's who really more influenced me, you know, to, to, to kind of go out and just play guitar by myself to begin with. The world falls apart, something Because if you strip away this, all that's left is the, the words and the yeah, guitar. And the guitar, yeah. yeah, exactly. So, you know, it, it's the same thing. I mean, as, as you progress as a rock band, you... You start to do things. I mean, I could, I would be quite honest and tell you that on, on acoustic guitar, Hollow Time Bomb probably wouldn't sound very good. It would be very boring. You know, I mean, and then you get to, you know, you get to explore avenues of sonics and, and, and how you can develop some songs and what you can do with too much or too little or, you know, that's the, those are the great headaches that bands go through in their careers, you know, it's all the process of elimination and finding out if what works and what doesn't. I played uh, by myself largely, kind of Hayden-esque-ish yeah. for about three years all over town, lots of, lots of railway shows, <laughs> and uh, the Arts Club. I always wrote songs in the pop rock vein, and a friend of mine just came up to me one day and said, you know, you don't write folk songs, man. Uh, get a band. 
So, uh, so I did. For our progression is, you know, usually you start being in a rock band and you go to acoustic later. I right. just did it backwards. I spent so much time, I think two years, trying to make an acoustic sound like an electric live. And uh, I gave it up about a year and a half ago and just went, I forget it. I went and bought uh, a couple electric guitars and, uh, you know, and we just, you know, went for that kind of thing. I don't even think I really ever did folk music per se. I just think I just did rock songs on an acoustic guitar. It was just a lot less hassle to carry around one instrument and not have to rely on anybody else. In Alabama, the hotel room, I reflect on a sweet perfume. Say, I'm down here. They will not get away with it again. No. When the night comes in. It's a very strange thing, I, I think, being a songwriter, because there's two sides to it. Do you want to sell a lot of records, or do you just want to be the kind of band that 20 years from now, kids go out and try to, like, maybe you only sell 20,000 records, but kids actively seek out your record because they're like, I would really love to, you know, as an influence. I mean, like a Pixies. Or, or Nick Drake, yeah, or anyone like that. For me, the Pixies were a really strange band in that respect because I thought they were absolutely an excellent group. Just an ex I listened to them this day religiously, and they never. I mean, they had they had success to a certain level, but never the kind of success that when I listened to them as a band of, that I thought, oh, who in the world wouldn't buy that album? Yeah, I just looked at it. I looked at the freedom and the chaos of it and its structures, and uh, you know, I guess like a lot of bands in the early '90s and that kind of thing, I took from it. You know what I mean? I. It's a, it, that record very much is a template for a lot of albums that have been made in this decade. And it's not that I've ever really wanted to copy the Pixies. I just, I've, I'm really a great fan of the fact how they build from a bass drum's root and guitars more are something that moves across those instead of it all falling into place, you know. <laughs> When you go from writing maybe folk rock based material for a long, long time, you know, you can have those 12 verses with the same chord progression and you can do your whole hard rain's gonna fall kind of thing. And then when you start doing it with a rock band, you've got two verses, two choruses, and a bridge to do the exact same thing. Yeah. So basically, you start trying to put a whole bunch of ideas, packing them into four lines. And uh, for me, I've found that. Uh, I kind of enjoy it in a strange Frank Black kind of way. Words become almost to the listener a little less important and um, you've got to almost search for words that cut more than you do when it's just you and an acoustic guitar because there's some innocence about that that allows even the most sometimes mundane things to come through. About, about having a major label deal. I mean, yeah, more people can go out and get it as opposed to have it being indie. But there, I think there's the misconception that there's this huge check, there's limos, there's chicks, there's, uh, you know. A limo is huge checks, no. <laughs> Process of elimination, that's what I call that. Yeah. <laughs> um, um, yeah, it's a bit of a fallacy, especially in this country. I didn't really get in it for the money or the limo. I mean, I wouldn't be doing this if that were my intention, you know? I've been poor before, and it really means nothing in the grand scale of things. You know, they're not going to they're not going to take a rib splitter and crack your chest apart when you're dead and stuff your inner body cavity with, with dollar bills so that you can take it with you when you die. I think honest art is motivated by money. Mm. No. But the money's not nice. <laughs> <laughs> I'm indestructible! Underdogs is, I think, what we're going to try to call it. Do you see yourself as underdog? Uh, to a certain extent, yeah. You know, we're, we're from this little back corner in the corner of uh, 
North America and we're going to try and break in the States. And I, I expect anybody who's trying to break in the States is an underdog. Uh, there's also a misconception amongst Canadian bands that also get a major label in the U.S. Yeah. It's like, well, you know, you reach this level in Canada, where else do you go? Let's, let's look to the U.S. Yeah. Again, there's that misconception there, too. Sure. And, and you've tasted that. There's a bit of a there's a bit of a thing Canadians have with needing to validate themselves by being successful south the border. I don't really know in the last three or four years that I would ever look at the state of American music and go, you know what, I really want to be successful south of the border. You know, I mean, America as a nation, their their best acts have always gone unnoticed. The most influential bands in American history sold very little records, and it will remain so probably you know infinite. I would think. So the fact that I haven't sold very many records down there suits me just fine. We sort of hold America up as the standard for success, yet we are contemptuous and call people sellouts when they actually do get success in the States. That's just called typically being Canadian, isn't it? It's like we're held up against the rest of the world in music from America, and people expect us to be something, but that we're never going to be that. You know what I mean? Like, Canadian bands will never be as cool as American bands are never as cool as British bands. Somehow we get lost in, in between. And I find that I find that kind of strange and sad in a way. I mean, how many times I've been asked, you know, how do you guys feel about in America? Do you want to make it big in America? And that kind of thing. Like, we've even, we've, we've even had show reviews going, you know, these guys are pretty good, but, you know, they haven't really done anything in America, so they're not that great. And hell, you know, I don't live in America. Why am I being held up to that standard at all, you know? It's absolutely ridiculous. I think it's ridiculous that when, you know, especially the media in this country kind of holds you up to this, uh, this standard that if you're not great somewhere else, then what's the point? You know what I mean? And all I have to say about that is look who's ruling America right now. <laughs> so don't go giving them any f***ing credit. Okay, because if InSync can break the world record for record sales in one day, that's saying something really wrong about America. We're in the dark days of rock and roll. There is no question about that. We've been talking about this for the last two days, and it's entirely true. It's, rock is at an all-time low as far as, uh, you know, as far as what people, you know, mass consumption is concerned and that kind of thing. Things may, things will, may turn around, maybe you want the pop monster is definitely here. That is, you know, for sure. And there's a lot of disposable, you know, a lot of, a lot of disposable, uh, music out there everybody's guilty of it man because and it, it's also uh, it's also the light that the entire business is cast in too i mean i'm sure people think that of us in some respect as well and you just kind of do what you do and if you know if it influences people to do things that that's fine you know or if you end up just be having a song on the radio that's really big and you want to equate success with that you sold three trillion records so therefore you must be better you know you know, I would just have to say, you know, I, I would have to say that uh, how many bands can you count, you know, Millie Vanilli comes to mind. Girl, you know. What was everybody thinking there? Or are they just musical geniuses or whoever the hell wrote that? Are they musical geniuses or ABC for that matter? Or whoever the hell you want to pull out of the hat who sold, you know, who let the dogs out? Yeah, there's a there's a bit of genius right there. Who let the dogs out? They've sold millions of records too, but does it make them great? No. So I don't really think that you can you can really register a band's worth on their record sales. I really don't think that you can. I mean, obviously, a certain you've got to validate your existence by selling a certain amount of records. I mean, if you sell 12 records, it doesn't mean you're the greatest band in the world, but it doesn't mean that you have to sell 10 times platinum to be a fa you know a fantastic band. run the gamut. Um, that's one thing I think on, a, on our last two records that we did and uh, one thing I, we continue to do, which is just kind of have everything at once on a record. I think one of the most important things to us for is just that we make albums that people can sit down and listen to from beginning to end. I've always been a B-side kind of guy myself, right? Uh, singles, schmingles. It's kind of, those bore me. It's the, it's the meat of the record. When you listen to an album, it's the things you get lost in. And I always enjoyed that about albums when I was growing up. You know, you go out and buy like the Regatta de Blanc, right? And a song like, say, Does Everyone Stare the Way I Do? 
right? You, you kind of hear that song, and of course everyone knows Message in a Bottle and Walking on the Moon and, and that kind of thing, but you think somewhere in your head, in your own little universe, you're the only person that knows that song exists. And it kind of holds a special meaning for you. So I've always been really, really, really captured by moments on records like that. And those, for me, have always been the special parts of albums. Say hello. Apparitions, is still the best song you've ever written? Oh, one of them. I'd say one of them. I'd say I equaled it, maybe, in my eyes, with a couple new songs on this record. A couple on Suburbia would be up there for me, um, probably. Born to Kill? Um, yeah. I mean, at the time, I very much thought so. There's no actual performance footage. No. It's just, no. you don't miss it. No, it's, it, that's, that video was kind of haphazardly done because we had a completely uh, different idea for it, and, uh, we were supposed to go down to Mexico and shoot it, and it kind of fell apart in the stages, and we were really busy. So I ended up talking to Bill Morrison, who directed it, and um, we kind of came up with the idea in a day and then shot it the day after that, kind of starting for two days. So, uh, and we just really didn't want, you know, we've done two videos where we play the guitars and move around and stuff, and we thought it would just be interesting to do one where no one sings and no one plays anything. It, it was funny because when we got we got a lot of heat from some from from everyone just going, you know, well. In the Apparitions video, everyone just doesn't, I don't think, realize that you guys are the band. <laughs> they, maybe they just think you're actors or something. And I actually have gotten that a couple times. People go, you're the guy in the Matthew Good Band video, aren't you? You know, and it'll be like, <laughs> I know, it's funny as hell. I'm free, I'm laughing at you. You're laughing at me. Bill, if you're watching this, you are the best director. Congratulations. Yeah, We've been, uh, we made this for you in Metal Shop. We've been Bill. working all day in Metal Shop to make you this. I appreciate that. Very nice. I know awards and that kind of stuff. Not that big of a deal to you. Not really, no. But a lot of the awards you won for Chart Magazine were nominated by the fans. That's cool. Yeah, yeah. I think that's great, actually. That makes it more special. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I mean, I, I think you know when this business is so strange. You know, the ins. I mean, you deal with it every day, I'm sure, and it, it it's uh, the ins and outs of it. There's so many tastemakers out there, and people, and critics, and everyone's got an opinion or a voice. And it seems almost when you're planning things or when you're going through the creation process of making an album, you have all these voices talking to you. But it's the people that ultimately decide whether what you do is good or not, or whether they like it or not. You know, it's an entirely subjective thing. And uh, so I always find it strange when you're, you know, you're up for awards, like say, you know, a Juno or something. Which I, I think the Junos are great. I mean, don't get me wrong. It's a, you know, a Canadian award, and, and that's a, it's a good thing that we have them. But for me, in in some respects, it's really strange because you throw all these people in a room, and it's like taking a whole bunch of painters and uh, saying, well, who's the better painter? Marking who's, it. Yeah, who's the better artist? How does that exactly work? It, to me, that makes absolutely no sense. Some songs become redundancy. I mean, it's just kind of like, you know, like Rico, for example. This is where he shows you the clip so you can equate what I'm talking about. I hate that song. Indestructible, hate that song. There's plenty of things I don't like. Because you played them so bad. much? They're bad, man. They're just bad songs. You might be saying in five or six years some of the material sure. on the brand new one, though. Absolutely. That's the great thing about being me, though, isn't it? And I can badmouth it all I want. Actually, everyone, feel free. Go right ahead. I mean, those are just songs that I look, that I personally look back on and go, eh, that was not my brightest moment. You know, I'm getting better with it. Beautiful Midnight doesn't have a song on it, but I listen to and go, what was I thinking? I like that. I found me a reason. 
check me tomorrow We'll see if I'm leaking Push and push and push till it hurts when people describe you as a brilliant songwriter, people have. Mm -hmm. Where? You, maybe your family. <laughs> My mom. <laughs> being polite. I'm sure you've heard that in reviews, maybe mm -hmm. some critics. So what, what do you think they're zeroing in on? I don't know. I mean, lyrical content's always been a pretty big piece of the pie. You know, I kind of just do what I do, and if people like it, I guess they like it. If they don't, they don't. You know, I mean, that's pretty much all one can expect from anything they do that's artistic. I'm kind of a voyeur in there, as far as, you know, lyrical content's concerned. I, the world is such a ridiculous place. There's just so much you can say about it, right? And sometimes being literal is a little too dangerous. Sometimes being literal is a good thing. But sometimes it's, you know, a little too dangerous. But the simple fact that, you know, people, they're, you know, they have no openness to a song. They can interpret it their own way. And that's sometimes better for them to do, because if you can apply anything to your own life, it becomes, you know, tenfold. <laughs> Band fan, you want to get into the lyrics and figure out what's going on inside that head of yours. <laughs> it gets pretty dark. You're, you're living in a strange neighborhood, man. Everything's. I think everything is reflective in a way of your surroundings, right? Obviously, you're right. You know, and, and, and things get intermingled with, you know, your perception and other people's perception and, and maybe the way it really is and that kind of thing. I've always. I don't know, man. I'm just not a half a fan of happy happy. I'm just. I'm not. You know. I mean. Things like that, as far as making albums go, they come and go kind of thing, you know what I mean? It's like how many love songs can be written, you know? But, uh, I don't know. People I always find, if you're trying to say something to them, or trying to reach them on any kind of level, I mean, because as far as, as, as being literal, literal is concerned, people are always going to apply it to themselves. They're not going to take, you know, try to figure out exactly what I meant by anything. So they're going to apply it to themselves. And if they can do that, then, you know, my job's done. I do one of those every month, and they range from everywhere from like 25 pages or 30 pages to two. But from what I understand, what I've been told, the numbers is about the first week of every month, about 30,000 people read that about that. So I'm like, I know it's ridiculous. I, it's a lot of people sniffing glue out there or something. I don't know what they're doing. I'm going through some of the book, but what I realized is music is just a uh, an avenue for you to have an excuse to write. Exactly, true. Very true. Like, it doesn't matter what what form, you just need to write. Sure, absolutely true. Yeah? Mm-hmm. I'd say so. By far, this is the most dangerous aspect, aspect of MSPI. Attempting to drive a car, work a washing machine, or bake cookies can turn into acts that rival the dangers of walking through a minefield. There's nothing worse for people suffering from S MSPI than trying to drive a car, train, boat, plane, or zeppelin. <laughs> <laughs> I have to blame it on my grandmother, really. She got me into it when I was like eight or nine years old, and I just haven't stopped. So, we get some good quotes just some, from actual emails that I've got. My favorite, my personal favorite is Dear Mr. Good, you are a loudmouth that should be ashamed of not loving Canada. I assume that you have a problem with Canada since you didn't bother even to go and pick up your Juno Awards at the Junos. Canadians are supposed to be known for being polite, but you just give Canadians a bad name. I used to like your band a lot, and will, but won't listen to your CDs anymore because of your attitude. You should remember that bands need people to buy their records, and that it is not in your best interest to make them angry. P.S. Ian is hot. That about sums it up, I'd say. Okay. Oh, this, this is, you, this is you like this one? Why don't you just shut up about things you don't know anything about? 
Our Lady Peace is an excellent band and much more talented than you'll ever be. You haven't put out a good CD since Under the Table and Dreaming anyway. <laughs> okay. Yes. In case you don't know what that album is, that it's is Dave actually, Matthews it's Band. Dave right Matthews here. Band. Yes. Why would you say? That hasn't been the first time you've been called a Dave Matthews Band by accident. I'm wondering, have you heard if anyone has called the Dave Matthews Band the Matthew Good Band yet? In Canada, they have. I know that they've messed up on the radio even while I was listening. So. That's how I gauge, that's how we gauge our popularity. See, when we first started out, the Dave Matthews Band was obviously a little bit, before, maybe a year before us. So we were kind of mistaken for them, you know. So in Canada now, they're kind of mistaken for us. So obviously we passed them at some point. So that's how we gauge our success, pretty much. Didn't actually Dave call you at one time and wanted to start like a side project with just you and him, like a duo that Dave? Don't Matthews go there, dude. Did. You know what? It's going to end badly for you. It's going to end badly for you. <laughs> I will tell you, it is pretty cool to have an army of kids out there that, you know what I mean, that, uh, I don't know, it's, it's not like, it's not about really that they think of me on a certain plateau, it's kind of like we're all together, you know, like we're all part of the same group, that's how I kind of look at it, you know. Let's go to the folks here, uh, who is this on line one, hello. Hi gentlemen, this is Sarah Louise. Hi Sarah Louise. Hey, how you doing? I just want to let you guys know that a couple of years ago, I found myself in pretty devastating surroundings and I didn't think there was much else for me in the world. And then I found Ghetto Astronauts and it made me see just how limiting and ridiculous my situation was. So I got cur courage and I became fearless and I left it. Rich and me were getting in the van last night. What did that lady say, Rich? She said uh, she wanted to thank you because your music helped her get through her mother's death. Which is like the heaviest thing that anyone, anyway, you know, I just looked at her and I said, thanks, you know. And it, it's situations like that, when people say things like that to you, completely off the cuff as you're getting into a van. And you're just like, you know what, I could quit now. What more is there to achieve at this, if someone's willing to say that to you? You know, not a lot. And I just want to tell you guys that you touch souls. You do great things for people. And I want you to know that if there's anything I can do for you, like for your soul while you're in my town, or anything, anytime, ever, I just want you guys to know that I love you, and a lot of people love you, and you guys are doing excellent work for the world. Thank you, my dear. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you very much. That you're means welcome. a lot to us. Means a lot. That's worth more than a million dollars, man. All right. Have a good show. Thanks. Do you prefer being in a studio when you can get it exactly the way you want it? Or do you yeah, prefer yeah. being on a stage when... I think they're two entirely different things. For me, kind of, in the context of that perfection, it's about capturing something in a studio. It's about capturing something specific. And the closer you get to capturing it in its purest form, the more perfect it is, obviously. Whereas, uh, live... You know, there's a lot of factors that go into it, obviously energy, uh, yeah. intent, yeah. how you happen to be feeling that day. Screaming fans. Here we go. Yeah! Matt gets inundated with a lot of people coming up to him all the time, and it's, you know, that's a lot of pressure. You know, it's weird. You know, I think it's very weird for him to be in a room and just have, just know that people are looking at him all the time, right? And watching what he's going to do. How are you supposed to love, you know, how are you supposed to love fame? There's entirely too much ego involved in that, isn't there? 
I could lose my hands in a tragic drill press accident or something like that. You never know. And uh, anything can be taken away from anyone at any time. You know, it's the way the world is. I mean, and, and, and at some point, there's got to be a counterbalance. At some point, you've got to be able to sit back and listen and, and your, say to yourself, you know, you're still you. You know what I mean? And uh, if you lose sight of that, then you're screwed, really. Because what happens if all this goes away? You know, the person you once were is gone, and the person that you have to be is, is all that remains. And, you know, one day no one's really going to give a shit about that. Team up. Open it up. Open it up. Man. I never got into this to really, for that, I got into it to make records, to make albums, you know what I mean? To make 10 records, to have the kind of career where I could make 10 albums. You know? Sometimes we get dissed, but you know, that's cool. Everyone is allowed to voice their own opinion, and uh, uh, if, that, if that's the way it is, then that's cool. <laughs> so, somehow we still sleep at night. No, I was taken out of context, really. I mean, it was just printed like I attacked them uh, right out of the gates, and it was I was talking about something that had to do with Canadian bands in America and that kind of thing, and I was asked my opinion, and I gave it. Matt, if, if you're listening, if this is a joke, man, we must sit down and have a cocktail because you are a funny guy. Other than that, it doesn't matter. There was no malicious intent given. I mean, everybody knows that uh, I don't really mince my words and never have. And, uh, you know, I don't really, uh, I wasn't an attack on anybody's uh, our character as a human being or anything. I just was asked about a band and I'm, I gave my opinion, as anyone would give their opinion about any other band. You know, and it, I think that it uh, is rather unconscionable if I'm in an in, just because I'm in this industry, that I'm not allowed to have an opinion. What the hell's with that? People are allowed to have opinions about people. You hate our band? I don't care. You have the right to. It's cool by me. What surprised you most about that whole thing? Was the oh, fact that people it was couldn't believe that people were saying things? Sure, it was an off-the-cuff remark. It was just made. It was made very prominent and prevalent in, in in that interview with the Calgary Sun, and it took on a life of its own. You know, art's art, man. It's a subjective thing. People are allowed to have opinions, me included. I mean, really, I don't, I only ever was interviewed about it one time on television. This is the second time I've in as many years as. I've uh, been interviewed about it. I think that, you know, they probably talked more to OLT about it than, I, than you have to me, or anybody has to me, so... Does honesty frighten people, maybe? Probably, maybe a little bit, yeah. You know? We don't really come from a country of people who have, you know, that's their thing. I mean, the thing about it is, is life is life, and what do you have really to lose about giving your opinion? I mean, no, not only giving your opinion, but just, you know, stating something that you happen to think. You know, as far as, I mean, I, I, you can be opinionated about many things. I mean, that was just obviously my reflection on something. And obviously the entire quote wasn't included in, 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 in what was printed. I, I went about qualifying my reasons. And to tell you the truth, that was a little off topic as to what we were actually talking about. But, yeah, sure. They all always seem, you know, now it's come to the point where I get interviewed by people and, and uh, they just kind of almost talk about how difficult it was to interview me. You know, almost make it seem like they went through some kind of great ordeal and there's not really much mentioned about me in it, right? So, uh, I don't know. I think a lot of bands in this day and age are caught up, unfortunately, with having a successful record and wanting to reproduce what they had done before, and they get caught in a really dangerous cycle where that just ends up being their whole career, reproducing themselves for mass consumption. And you know what? If it doesn't work and the whole thing goes straight down the tubes because I made a bad judgment call or something, then so be it. That'll just be the way it, you know, that's, that's life, right? That but at least I did it, I did what, you know, this band being four individuals did what we wanted to do, and we've got that, so. Is that a lot easier said than done? Because you're up against corporations with boardrooms of people who are, you know, sitting in on marketing meetings, analyzing art. Sure, sure. I mean, this business is too, you know, this business, you dance with the devil.
I just prefer to do it with a loaded weapon behind my back. <laughs> That's, you know, pretty much it. Yeah. You know, it's a, it's all it's a give and take. I mean, we come from a very strange. When we come, we were an indie band for so long, right? And we were in charge of everything. Even even underdogs was paid for by our, we paid for it ourselves, and 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 uh, had a large say in, in in what was done with it to certain extents. Um, but yeah, no, I I don't think I've I have problems with that. I mean, if I I couldn't. I don't think if I had a dime for every time I was asked by an American a and guy or by somebody else to re-record Symbolistic White Walls again and re-release it, I'd be a rich man. We were independent for a long, long time, and we had some really good success on an independent level. Um, and for me, that was really empowering, you know, and it taught us a lot of lessons. And uh, one of the great things about it was is now that we moved into the position where we are, you know, affiliated with a major label such as Universal, we still retained our ability to make our own decisions because we came from that background and gained that kind of respect. So that's helped immensely. Right. Because usually they don't stick their fingers in my pot, so which is nice to do. At this point in the band's career, can you feel the anticipation for a new MGB record? A little, I guess. Yeah, we're at that point in our career where we have to pretty much buy our own records and scan them in warehouses so we know we look important. Yeah, I mean, the last record came out number one, so we've had to actually create a new category, the point five. Exactly. It's like above, so it's above and beyond. Exactly. It's, it's all right. It's, it's all advanced marketing you need not concern yourself with. It's kind of turned into a bit of an institution. So that's okay. There's no problem in that. Well, I suppose where I'm going with this, Matthew, is you have reached the upper elite of the Canadian music industry at this point. <laughs> <laughs> which means I've reached the upper echelon of Canadian, the Canadian music industry, which I fall five feet, I won't hurt myself. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I don't. That's not really a big thing to be bragging about. Right? At what point did you realize maybe you have got The air up here is thin, you know. <laughs> yeah. yeah, there are a lot of people, they're, they're, they're watching and waiting. And, you know, I damn well better deliver. Hopefully we'll miserably disappoint everybody. Yeah, I think uh, we that's what the, we set out to do. Really. Yeah, we want to be the first band in Canadian history to actually set out to make a terrible record that is doomed for failure. Because it's never been done, really. I know in the state of music today, it'll probably sell just dump truck loads of copies. So, it's a win-win, really. really, for us. At one point you said uh, you hope you never get comfortable with the creative process. Yeah, absolutely. I think if it remains static, it doesn't go anywhere. It has no room to evolve or change, right? I mean, I don't think that I don't think that creativity necessarily is something that grows. I don't think you learn to do it better instinctively. I mean, obviously through the mechanics of it, you do yes, but instinctively you don't learn to do it on greater levels, but just on different planes, right? I mean, when I did Beautiful Midnight, I sat down and consciously wrote a record about my past. This record, you know, is you know I, I had a year and a half worth of stress attacks and throwing up for eight hours, then going playing shows and passing out and hitting my head on the floor and, and that kind of thing. Just a lot of stress-related issues that weren't very fun. And uh, I had the germs of a whole bunch of the songs, and I hold myself up in a, in a hotel room in Whistler for three weeks, and it basically all came out of me. We weren't really scheduled to start making a record. But I had talked with several friends, and they were just like, you know, just for your sanity, you better just go in and make this record. Which, of course, ended up setting off a massive chain, a whole bunch of a chain of or a chain of events that uh, led to our actual demise for a little while. There, we broke up for a little while, I guess, and uh, you know, which of course was popularized with Dave leaving the band, which of course was one of the big things about it and that kind of thing. But it kind of all came to a head one night, I guess, during the whole the whole Dave thing and, 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 and that. I mean, we were on again, off again, hourly as a group. We had a bit of a sit-down. I talked to Dave for a long time. And it was kind of not just, it wasn't a me and Dave situation. It was an everybody situation with everybody, right? And that, that's just like being in a family. It's bound to happen. But uh, that kind of brought it, you know, to a head with me. It's just kind of like, you know, you get so far with something, everyone becomes so unbelievably egotistical about it that you can't get your own head out of your ass long enough to realize you got something good, you know? And there's a reason why tension helps us create certain things. And it was kind of just, you know, the inevitable conclusion of events that had been set in motion prior. Page 95. The handbook, yes. Rule 15, no one remembers who you weren't, 
just who you were. That's very true. How do you want to be remembered, Matthew Good? Um, you know, I, I, I'm sure that any remembrance of me will be measured in the merit of my words and my actions. You know, and, so, and as they should be. You know, I mean, you can you can say and do things that people may not particularly like, but if you do them in earnest and 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 you know you believe them, you believe in them, then you know as long as they're you know they're not inhumane. You, you can make mistakes. You can do things you later regret. But if you if you give up that part of yourself, or you, it's never forgivable. You'll live an entire life just wishing it had never happened, right? So why bother? Because the truth of the matter is, is you only get to do this one time, right? It's one time around. So make the most of that one time around you've got. You know what I realized? You mm -hmm. take away the O. And, and what do you got? It's God. Oh, God. Take away the D and what do you got, right? <laughs>